Come on, why don't we give Jesus a clap and honor him? He's the hero in our story. He's the one we're waiting for. Jesus, we honor you. You're the very best. We welcome you. We thank you. Our lives are never the same because of you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and touch us very deeply today. Amen. Well, great to see everyone and great to be back again. And I really do encourage the businessmen to get to that uh, business uh, uh, meeting with uh, Anthony Talent. It'll really do you good. One of the interesting things I found about New Zealand is, is this. They want a lot of things, but don't understand how to get there. And one of the ways you get to change your life is to get fresh input, to get ideas and thinking that you haven't experienced before. And uh, some people are afraid to do that because they don't want to change. Some people are afraid to do it because they feel intimidated by someone successful. But I have found that if you want to grow in life, you need to connect with people who are higher and better and bigger than you are and find out what got them there. And when you do that, your life begins to shift. And uh, we should never be intimidated because someone's more successful, more rich or more financial or whatever. It doesn't really matter. You can learn how they got there because they didn't start at the top, they grew their way there. And I really encourage you to uh, set aside time to come and uh, engage with Andy Tallett and uh, his story, which I've been aware of for 20 years or so, is extraordinary how God has given him such influence. And even while we were traveling together over to Argentina, he just prayed for the lady next to her and her uh, ankle was healed from a long-standing pain, Achilles tendon problem. And uh, just wonderful to see Christian businessmen. Most New Zealand businessmen separate their life with God from their life with business. And the result is then they struggle in their business and in their life with God. God called you to be a businessman, so you need to learn how to bring God into the realm you live in business. So I do encourage you to make this investment in your, in your life. It'll be really helpful for you. Anyway, okay, well, let's update you. I've just, as you were, I've been up in Argentina. Well, it was a trouble. I nearly couldn't have got, I wouldn't have got there if it hadn't been for Anthony Hoffening. I got on a plane uh, to go to Auckland, fly over to Argentina, doing a direct flight. Uh, as I got on the plane, I got a notice that the plane had, uh, had a massive dropped out of the air and uh, 50 people hit the roof and they went to hospital afterwards and our flight was canceled. So I got to Auckland with no flights uh, to get there and uh, Anthony met me there and he was coming with me and he had arranged to uh, get us to as far as America. So we got on a plane to America, not knowing whether we'd make it to South America not even knowing whether they'd let us into America because we didn't really have anywhere else to go. And, uh, but we believed that God would help us. It was what he wanted to do was to get us there. Uh, we got to uh, uh, America and by then someone had worked out some flights. We got the first flight, but then it was delayed, 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 delayed. And getting to South America depended on a link. And uh, if we missed the link, then we couldn't have made it for another 48 hours. Uh, we just prayed together. We made it just by five minutes ran out of one plane, ran into the other plane, and it took off. And uh, so, so we got there, finally got there. And uh, it just it, quite remarkable uh, experience. I haven't been to South America like that to connect in, in with the South American nation, but the Lord has opened up huge doors there now and many invitations to go to these, these nations. And uh, the need, the enormous need, the almost hunger for God. And we were there uh, 70 years after revival broke out there in uh, 1954, there was a revival, touched the whole of Argentina and went out into the West, miracle revival. So it was great to be able to feel we were redigging the wells again. So we'll just pop you up a few pictures so you can see, hopefully they'll turn out. There's a couple of little video clips. And there you see the crowd. We, we did uh, two big, uh, one night meeting for uh, uh, an evangelistic crusade and then one night meeting for pastors and leaders and later on the evening they came. Uh, with their families. Uh, I got to speak and minister at the uh, pastor's conference, 7,000 people, and just God moved. We saw massive deliverances. There we are. You can see people and the hunger they have. Next one. You get to an idea how proud they are of Argentina, and uh, you can kind of see there it is. Now, that's the pastor's meeting. <laughs> that's the pastor's meeting. And uh, huge crowds of it. Just go back to that other one again. You can see it again. 
So that's what the pastors' meeting was like. They got, they're all got their uh, phones up and waving around and so on. And uh, it was just jam-packed. Well, that was the one I got to preach at. Thousands of people touched. So many you can't go out among them. You've just got to believe for the power of God to hit them where they are. So I've been uh, praying into that, fasting into that, making declarations for a while. Next one. That gives you, again, that's still, again, the pastors and leaders meeting. And that's something else. And this uh, lady here, massive healing, couldn't hear, and, uh, and uh, her, her hearing was completely opened up. Uh, she also had a problem with, um, uh, she was missing a womb and, a, and uh, two ovaries, and uh, the doctors, we took doctors with us, and uh, they did an ultrasonic scan, and the womb had been replaced, and the two ovaries had been replaced. She was able to have children again. She's weeping and crying and uh, very excited about it. Next one. And here's the boy. He couldn't speak. He's a, he was totally deaf and he couldn't walk. And uh, he's now able to speak uh, and say words. And uh, just, you can imagine the, the tremendous impact on the parents to see miracles like that. So we saw a number of creative miracles. We had a number of people. Uh, creative miracle means there was no organ and God supernaturally created it in their body. That's what I'm, so you need to understand that God has not changed. And so they had doctors that could do an ultrasonic scan and then take a photo of the organ to give testimony that this was true, that this has actually happened, where one, one uh, man had a lung missing. There was a scar. He had, had done an operation on him, found the lung was totally destroyed, took the lung out. So he had one lung. They, uh, ref they took a scan after he'd been prayed for, and uh, his lung had been totally replaced. There's a new lung. There are two lungs there. It's like your mind just can hardly comprehend it. So we had a number of people with kidneys, one guy with lungs, and, and a lady here with ovaries and whatever. We had some people. There we go. That's the pastor's meeting uh, in the evening after I prayed for them, got them all delivered. And you can see she's pretty wild. Crowds of people everywhere, passion everywhere, hunger for God everywhere. And a massive move of deliverance, it was quite exciting. A lot of these countries bring their flags and wave their flags. Women in Pakistan, they wave the flag. Argentina, wave the flag. That man's from Colombia. He used to be a drug dealer. These are people at our convention getting saved. We had over 10,000 decisions for Christ, and you can see them streaming. See, they're streaming at the top. These are all just streaming forward to give their lives to Christ. We had uh, 1,000 10,000 saved in that meeting. They're all coming up now. They just kept coming like that and scream, 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 scream to people, both sides, and coming down from the tops. And uh, the teams had been out on the streets. Ryder was getting there. And there were, I think, oh, there were 50,000 decisions for Christ in just the space of a couple of weeks. And then just hundreds and hundreds. There were 690 recorded miracles where they were able to check them and get their testimony. But there were many we never got the chance to. I prayed for people and deaf ears were opened and we had eyes restored. And there they are. Isn't that something, eh? No more, there's any more? That's it. Wow. It's just so, so good. We so much need revival in our nation. So much need the power of God. And it really comes through prayer and, uh, and faith. And uh, it comes for us. We, we, we really have to press in for these kind of things to happen. So I can't wait to see more happening in our own nation. Say amen. A revival among young people, a revival in the schools, all of that. We need all of those things. Amen. Wow. Well, I was sharing on the kingdom of God. How many people have had a bit of a mind spread on the kingdom of God now? And, it, it, and I'm deliberately taking time to try and get you to expand your thinking. Remember, when you were born again, in Colossians 1.13, we were delivered or rescued out of the power of darkness. We were rescued from the dominion of invisible spirit beings, and we were held and trapped by sin under their influence. Now, of course, we thought we didn't realize that. We were blinded to that. 
That's why we were trapped. We were blinded to what we were in. And so when you see the problems in the world, they're the reflection of the control of hidden spirit beings over people's lives. And when we're in Argentina, in the altar call, it was heart touching, heartbreaking. I start to talk, I'll probably start to cry. But just hundred thousands of young people weeping who've been abused and defiled and broken families and, and addictions. And the moment we come near them, they would break and weep and weep and weep as the presence of God would come upon them. So we're rescued out of the kingdom, the influence, the ruling power of a wicked king and transferred or shifted under a new king in a new kingdom. We become citizens of that kingdom. And uh, that's what happened when you got born again. The Spirit of God came into you, and a legal transfer, you became a citizen of heaven. You became a different person, a new creation person. But we can still live our lives entangled in the old way and never experience the life and blessing of the kingdom. So because we're part of a new kingdom, our king, in order to help us grow and look after us, places in a church called the family of God. There are many different types of churches and different emphasis and whatever, but the church is not the end. The church is the family we're planted in to grow. The role of the church is to bring us into community and to serving and to raise us as sons and daughters for God's purpose in our life. You've got to catch that. Otherwise, you don't understand what church is about. You don't place value on the family which God calls his family. Yeah. Is his family perfect? No, not yet. It's full of all kinds of stuff. And people get offended. Why would you get offended? Family's always full of stuff. You know that. <laughs> Maybe God sets you next to someone to offend you just to get you to learn to practice over forgiveness, overcome offenses. <laughs> Whatever, you know, overcomes us, that's what we're in bondage to. So we saw then, that uh, we looked at a kingdom, we looked at the attributes of a kingdom, we found that the first thing was every kingdom has a king who rules. So when you got born again, you were brought out of rulership by an evil king and now placed under a king who loved you and gave his life for you, and in return he calls us to love him back. We love him because he first loved us. It's not a, it's not a relationship of duty, it's a relationship of love. He loved us, gave himself for us, therefore we love him in return. So we have a new king. And if you have a king, we saw that a king owns everything. And, and, and when he owns everything, he takes care of everything, makes sure everything gets provided for, we get protected, we get looked after, uh, and that makes us just stewards of a king. So that, remember, that changes your thinking around how you do life. Do you own anything? Well, only you can tell me that. If you think you own something, then look after it. You've got the whole weight of it on your shoulders. But if the king owns it all, then we can walk in a great measure of freedom and trust him to provide. We saw it's a territory. A kingdom is a territory. A king rules over. We saw that a, ter a kingdom has citizens. Uh, citizens are people who have privileges and also they have responsibilities. So as a kingdom person, a citizen, you have privileges, you get access to the resources of God, you need to learn how to access them. You also have responsibilities as in the kingdom. So every citizen in God's kingdom is a son and the king is their father. So that's an amazing situation. So not only do we come to God as our father, we come to him as the one who's in charge of the kingdom. So that's why Jesus taught, pray, our Father in heaven, we honor your name. Because you always honor your Father. And then he said, your kingdom come. Let your rule come. Let your will be in the earth, just like it is in the heavenly realm. In other words, we want your kingdom to manifest in our marriage, our families, our finances, our relationships, everything we put our hand to. That's what you're praying for. So you've, you've got to understand what you're looking for. You're looking for the rule of a king. And uh, so that's, that's what we're, we're working towards, working, living in. Okay, then we saw last time I, I finished up that a kingdom has a legal system, that there is a whole legal system and structure. I, I can't develop that in depth. I'm trying to just give you a little overview of these things. One of the most challenging areas of Christian that Christians face is the constant feeling of not being good enough of not having done enough and feeling guilty about what they have done. In other words, unable to get over it all. 
Now, you were never intended to live that way. People living that way are living under the law and under judgment and under the accusation of the devil. God wants you out of that and to learn freedom, which comes through his system of justice. God's justice is the cross. We sin, we deserve penalty, but God paid the price for us. That's the great news, good news, okay? You really need to get more. We'll do a bit more on the kingdom of God. It's really actually quite something. I, I just love it so much. And uh, so the next thing I want to touch on, and uh, uh, these things that I could share a lot on them, but we're just going to, I want you to get your thinking up. One of the, the things about a kingdom is a kingdom, all kingdoms have a culture. How many know kingdoms have a culture? That we live in a culture. I mean, now we have a culture around us. And uh, I'll just get this so it doesn't keep turning off on me where it was. Okay, so we have a culture. So what's a culture? Every society has a culture. So there's a Tongan culture. There's a Pacifica culture. There's, there's the Samoan culture, Chinese culture. You go to the Russian, Russian culture. We went into, uh, to Indonesia, Indonesian culture. Everywhere I go, there's a culture. And it's different. And uh, so what about the kingdom? We're in part of a kingdom. Then there's going to be a culture. So the kingdom of heaven also has a culture. So every society has culture. They have a certain culture. And the culture reflects what they believe. The culture reflects their ways, the ways of doing things. So you can see the culture in the art. You see the culture expressed through the art. So if the culture is defiled by demons, the, the art will be very demonic, the ugly, be terrible. Uh, it's seen in the music. So the culture is reflected through the music. Culture is reflected through how you dress. You go to different countries, they dress differently. Great for us to dress uh, our, in the way that reflects our culture. And uh, so it's a reflect in the food. You go to different places, well, the food's so different. You try different food. Every culture's got a whole range of different things like that, and also the language. So the culture literally is the way of doing life. And uh, so the kingdom of God has a culture you have to learn. Because the culture of the kingdom of God often is quite at conflict with the culture we've grown up in. And we say, well, I don't do it that way. We do it this way. But you're, new, you're a citizen of a new kingdom now. You need to make some changes and discover that the, the culture of heaven was uh, revealed in many aspects to the Jewish people who in their way of doing things reflect a lot of the culture that came by revelation from heaven. So culture of, the, of a kingdom comes from its king. Culture uh, reflects the values of the person who rules over the kingdom. So, so in the kingdom of God, the kingdom culture is a reflection of the values of its king. What he thinks is important, what he thinks is not important. So God, when God commissioned Jesus, he commissioned him not just to get some people saved and get them to heaven, but to establish the culture and the ways of the kingdom in the lives of a community called the church. So the church is called to develop a culture that's really radically different to the world around it. Right. It's a culture that differs it, it because it reflects what our king is like. Yeah. And we come in, we bring our old culture with us, our old ways with us, and it creates problems. So we have to commit to learn what are the ways of the kingdom? How do I do life as a citizen of a kingdom? And it's quite different. Yeah. And then you find the way you treat people, the way you do marriage, the way you raise children, the way you do fun. All these things will be done in a different way, a different way. So just what Jesus came to do. So, so a culture then reflects what you value. The things you value, you place a high priority on. So our culture, the cultures of, the, of, the, uh, of God reflects what God values. Get an idea? So, so if you look at the values or the culture of a society, the culture is based on the, what people believe is good and the things they believe are good, that's what they practice. The things they don't like, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they shame people for those things. So, so basically in a culture, it reflects what people value. So the kingdom of heaven will be quite different, of course. So Jesus taught about the values of the kingdom. You need to discover what they are. You only discover that if you read what Jesus taught. He came to teach. So one of his most important sermons was to teach the culture of the kingdom of God. Yeah. So in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, he said, Seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Now he starts to go through what we call the Beatitudes, which are basically the heart core attitudes that form the culture of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who have a humility, that are open to receive, that see their need, that actually recognize where they fit in God's plan. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Bless those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So in other words, he says, blessed, or there is favor from the king on those who bear those qualities. When Jesus uh, said to, uh, in Matthew uh, eleven twenty nine, 29, he said, come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden. In other words, if you're burdened down by life, come to me. Then he says, take my yoke on you. That's the yoke of a rabbi or the learning life, the lifestyle of the rabbi. And then he says, and let me teach you, for I am meek and humble in heart. I'm gentle and humble. I model that. That's my lifestyle. Let me teach you. And then you will find rest for your souls. So if you're burdened, Jesus says, come to me. and Let me teach you. Come and become joined and committed to my lifestyle, the lifestyle of the kingdom, and you'll find rest for your soul. You won't run around all stressed out. Our way of solving stressed out to medicate people rather than deal with the root issues, which is the, uh, the weight of, of life and the problems that are there. So, so in, the, in the kingdom of God, it, there's a value placed on humility, meekness or, or gentleness. Uh, there's a value for hunger for God. Bless those who hunger and thirst. What for? For righteousness. You hunger for things to be right, to be done right. Uh, Mercy, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So being merciful instead of judgmental is a kingdom culture. Yet the church is generally known as being judgmental. In other words, not reflecting the culture of the king, rather reflecting a religious culture. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. So purity, purity has to do with your motives in dealing with people having no agenda behind them. Purity has to do with being sexually clean, no defilement of sexual sin, sexual immorality, sexual perversion, sexual distortions, none of those things. Yet that's promoted in the culture. It's highlighted in the culture. In fact, it's being developed at the expense of our culture to change it. And so that puts Christians... Who, who are kingdom citizens increasingly in conflict with culture. There's no way out of it. You can't hold on to both, see? So the Bible says, like Jesus taught, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who engage people to help resolve conflicts and bring people back into harmony with one another. They are the mature sons of God. That's what God does. So, you, you, so all of those things there... You can see them. In, in the Bible, it talks about serving. It says, in the world, they're, they're great. They lord it over one another. They boss one another around. They, t- they take advantage of people. He says, it shall not be so among you. you a lot of people, that's how they think of people. They, they, they want to get a position of power and rule over it. That's wrong. It's not the kingdom of heaven. He says, if you want to be great, that's great that you want to be great, but here's how you go about it in the kingdom. If you want to be great, then be a servant. Learn to serve people and advance their welfare because that's what being great and having authority looks like in the kingdom of God. Amen. This, these are the, these are, you understand they challenge us because they're so contrary to what we've grown up with. But you're called to develop a kingdom lifestyle. Yeah. Seek first the rule of the king, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, his standards or ways or cultural values of life. Place that as a priority. Then God makes sure everything comes to you. So, of course, then you see then there's there's going to be a conflict in culture. And uh, in 1 1 John 2, verse 15 and 16, it said, don't love the world or the things of the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, did not come from the Father, but is of the world or the order that's on the government of demonic powers. Notice that. The lust of the flesh, seeing and wanting, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So the kingdom of God has a distinct culture that's different from the world. Its origin is from heaven. And so wherever it comes, it's different. 
Different isn't bad. Different's different. See? <laughs> and so the cultures of this world are influenced by demonic powers to varying degrees. There is uh, some thinking that we should make, consider that all cultures are equal. Well, the truth is all cultures are not equal because some are more demonically defiled than others and express things which are destructive and harmful to people. They're not, therefore, equal. And this creates some controversy when you hold that view. Uh, the cultures of uh, the kingdom of God comes into conflict with the culture of the world in many different ways. And Jesus never worried about that. He actually intentionally confronted the culture. Paul confronted the culture. In other words, he didn't agree with it, and if they didn't like it, he didn't care that they didn't like it or didn't like him. We're not to try and be nice to everyone and smile and just be quiet when things are evil. Right. We're to be salt and light. Yes. Salt means you restrain the corruption. Light means you speak up and show it up. Yeah. And if people don't like it, that's not your problem. It's only a problem if you need them to like you. So in Mark 7, 13, Jesus confronted the Pharisees, the religious culture. He said, you make the word of God of no effect through your tradition. So he, con he confronted religious traditions that were completely contrary to the way God orders things to be done. Paul confronted the culture. Look at this one here. And, uh, and I, I remember uh, a story a while ago, and uh, a great man of God in our nation, Bill Sabritsky, he was a great deliverance minister, and he was asking Ray Comfort, he, he, Ray Comfort, he says, how can I get to preach to unsaved people? So I seem to be in churches all the time. He said, oh, come along. We've got a, a, a Narawa here. There's a, there's a, a big uh, um, outing there. There's a big um, music festival. Come to the music festival. So he comes and brought him to the music festival. And then he said, well, how am I, and there's people everywhere in all states of dress and alcohol and drugs. Everything's going on there. And uh, he said, well, he said, how do, I, how do I get to speak to them? And he said, oh, hey, you just get your message ready. I'll get, them, I'll get the people ready for you. <laughs> so this is what he did he got up on a box and he did this is what it is he read in a loud voice this passage 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 surely you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom stop being deceived people who continue to engage in sexual immorality idolatry, adultery, sexual perversion homosexuality, fraud, greed, drunkenness verbal abuse and extortion will not inherit God's kingdom that's all he did. He read that out loud. Now, by the time he'd done that, there were about 50 people all shouting for his blood. And he stepped back and he said, there you are. There's your court. There's your congregation. They're all ready to go. So I, I, it just shows this power in the Word of God. But we should understand that while all these things are being promoted, God's Word says no one who practices those things will enter the kingdom of God. They can't inherit anything from the kingdom of God. Because they are contrary to the kingdom of God, they're part of a different culture. Now, of course, every culture's got its own, uh, its own distinctive features. So think about New Zealand. When you come to New Zealand, there are some wonderful things in New Zealand. Praise the Lord for New Zealand. But there are some awful things. Just awful. They are horrible. The tall poppy syndrome would be one. Where when someone does well, everyone says, oh, who do you think he is? He anything better than that. They will try to pull him down. That, that, that's so ungodly, it's a demotivator of people to excel. Yeah. Whereas you go to uh, America and they say, man, I've got this idea. Man, go for it. You, you can do it. Yeah. You say, I've got this idea in New Zealand. I think I can make a lot of money. No, nah, I don't think it'll work, mate. <laughs> do you understand? It's, it's, like, <laughs> it, it's like a prevailing cultural attitude. Or, ah, she'll be right, mate. Don't worry. Like, it, these sorts of things... They're just horrendous. They don't, they're not kingdom of heaven. They're Kiwi culture that is negative, destructive, and does not build. So, so you understand, you have to, as you get to understand the culture of the kingdom, you understand then the culture of the kingdom is a culture of excellence. So she'll be right has got no place in a culture of excellence. See, whatever you do, do from the heart, diligently as unto the Lord, not with eye service unto men as men pleases, but unto the, from the heart to the Lord, knowing from the Lord you receive the reward of inheritance. 
In other words, in everything we do, you give it your very best. Yeah. And somehow people think, come to church, can I just give it just to this or that or whatever? No. You, you, you're thinking wrong. You're thinking, she'll be right. Yeah, it'll be okay. Now, don't, don't think that way. That's a corruption of culture. Think, I serve a king, I represent a king, whatever I put my hand to, do it well, so I'm never embarrassed with what I did, and I'm not ashamed of it either. How about that? Whoa. Okay, now don't go poking anyone. And uh, <laughs> so, so New Zealand struggles with those things. It struggles with passivity. People are passive, very passive. And passivity can never advance anything of the kingdom of God. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, passionate, assertive men press into the kingdom. You understand? That's not Kiwi. So if you're passive, you've got to figure out how they get like that, and I've got to get out of that because I'm going nowhere. Passive people go nowhere. They actually have resigned that life is beyond their power to change and do anything. They're in a place of total defeat. You can't be passive. Don't be a passive man. Be an initiator. Well, I mean, I'm only just, we're just touching stuff here. But you can see how the kingdom really confronts all of that. And so, so some cultures are different to other cultures. Now, there, there are some features in culture which are just neutral. They, they've got neither good nor bad. They just happen, oh, that's interesting. It just is what it is, you know. They eat this kind of food. We eat this kind of food. That's, it's just as different. You know, and I ate that food, and then I was in the toilet for an hour. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. You know, it's, but it's neutral, you understand? And, but, but there's some things in culture are really good. And so we take the good things in our culture, and we're proud. These are things we have which are good. But then the, every culture has got a degree of demonic defilement, some things which are just plumb evil. When you come into the kingdom of God, those things you get rid of out of your life. Now, does, are people happy with you doing that? No, they're not. They, they feel, well, who do you think you are? You're better than us or something, you know? You know, got religion. No, I'm just living a different way now. I don't do that kind of stuff. And so some, and now the interesting, I'll just, I won't go too far into this. Let's just throw your thought out. In Leviticus 18, 23, when God is sending the people of Israel into the land of Canaan, he said, you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but utterly overthrow them and break down the sacred pillars. Don't defile yourself with any of these things, for by these things the nations are defiled, which is why I am casting them out before you. The land, the land is defiled. So I visit the iniquity, uh, the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. Now that's, I won't get too far into that. I want you to think about that. God is not saying to Israel, I'm giving you Canaan because you're better than the people. It's not that reason at all. I'm giving it because of a covenant, and I'm giving it to you because they have been, done things so evil. What were they doing? They were killing their children. They were sacrificing their children. They were, what were they doing? They were involved in idolatry. What were they doing? They are involved in homosexual practices, uh, all kinds of transgender practices. They are involved in many kinds of wor- evil, worship of evil gods and deities, involved in sorcerers and magicians, in curses. They are involved in calling up the grave. God said their activities defiled even the land, And so even the land can't stand them living there anymore. Got to get rid of them. So he he treats the land like something living that if you abuse it, then God sees to it you can't live there anymore. Think about that. And then he said to Israel, he said, if you do the same things, same thing will happen to you. The land will spit you out and you'll end up somewhere else, which is what happened to them. Because a covenant, God took them back. And plans to get them back, and those plans concerning the land have never changed. Now, some of you may have some struggles with that, but you have to see that God has made a promise to Israel of a section of territory that will be theirs. It's given by covenant, and He will fulfill it. Okay? Okay, here's, so, so the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God, then, is counterculture. So if you love being counterculture, great, be counterculture for God. 
<laughs> and be creative and whatever. So, so counterculture means that the way of life, what you value, what you do, how you do stuff, is different. So one of my daughters came home, Jo came home, and she said, Dad, our family's weird. I said, how awesome is that? How come we're weird? Who's saying we're weird? And he said, well, she said, I've looked in the classroom and I can't find any families where there's a father and mother living together with all of their children and they've got a happy family and eat together and do things like we do. What we take for granted is abnormal. Now, what we do as a family, to me, is normal kingdom culture. Father, a mother, and the children they produce, and they enjoy one another and eat together and celebrate life, and they're interested in one another. It doesn't happen by accident. You've got to build that. But to me, that is normal. And she was saying, I've got a whole class, and there's not one who's got that in the class, meaning the culture has now decayed. Now, it doesn't just happen that way. There are ideologies cause it to become that way. And behind the ideologies are demonic powers. So one of the keys in the kingdom of heaven is personal responsibility. So if you start giving, 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 and remove from people responsibility, you will decay the culture. You know, think about these things. Otherwise, you can't figure out what's really going on. And uh, so the, cult, the, the kingdom culture, for example, you want to be great. Awesome. Want to be great? Well, don't go pumping yourself. Just serve. Yeah. Greatness is found by serving. What about in the kingdom? Well, in the kingdom of heaven, don't you? you want to be rich? Awesome. Become generous. Yeah. How can that work? <laughs> it's true. It's the kingdom culture. See? Given it shall be given unto you. So it's like generosity is part of the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom... You should be a generous person. If you're not a generous person, you're in bondage. Generous person doesn't mean I've got lots of money to give. Gener generosity is a, a natural overflow of giving from a heart that's full of gratitude. And so you can be nice to people. You can smile at people. You've got an overflow. You can thank people. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. I really, and you can encourage people and you can give to people. This is what the kingdom's like. The kingdom is a generous kingdom. But our, our, our world around us is mean, holds it all in. And if, you, if, you're, if you've been influenced by that, you'll be like that. Don't be like that. You got a home, open it up, have people in for a meal, help people, shout people, buy things for people, just do what you can with what you have. So, so in, in the kingdom of heaven, uh, for example, in the kingdom culture, humility comes before honor. So when you humble yourself and serve, God lifts you up and promotes you. You see, in the world, they just want to promote themselves. If you have to promote yourself, well, then you've got to keep yourself out there. Hard job. If you humbly let God promote you, you don't have to worry about it. Got your back. In the, in the culture, the culture that we have is one of partiality. And so people look down on other people. They look down on people from other parts of even our area. But in the kingdom, it says honor all men. In other words, in the kingdom of God, everyone's valuable. So how can that be? Some of them are terrible people. No, no, no. They all have value to God. Our God values people. He has a different relationship with people depending on what their life is like. Do you understand how you treat people? That, that reflects the kingdom. And so, you know, every person that comes in here, treat them like they're special. Yeah. They treat every person like they're special, and soon they'll open their heart. Like I get on a bus trip. We're on, on a bus trip to go for a bus tour. And we're going to go to hop on, hop off bus. We do about two hours and go right around the whole city. We didn't make it. <laughs> Before I even got to the second stop, i got one person weeping in front of me and the other person listening in and they're weeping and now we're praying for them. We finally get off and carry on the conversation. And then the third person's weeping. We're praying for them. And then I see the other two, they're over witnessing and there we got some people weeping. And, and then they come over, hey, listen, we've, these people here, they, they've got no food. So we got some money and gave it to them. And then they're all weeping and we're praying for them. Now, do you understand that the kingdom has got overflow in it all the time? Overflow. You can always do something. 
there's always something you can overflow. So it's, it's like that's how kingdom works. It's just really quite different. So choose to be like that. See? And in and, and the kingdom of God, we make it our priority. So how about that? So we're, we're commanded in Romans 12 to actively resist being conformed to the culture of the world. Romans 12, present, verse 1, present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. In other words, present yourself and be available to God. And don't, by the way, don't be conformed to the world. In other words, don't get your value system from the media or education system. Because they will try and press you to think and believe and live a certain way. He says, but rather, that word conform means to be shaped so you all think and act and dress the same way and behave the same way and value the same thing. Don't be like that. He says, but rather be transformed. So the transformation is a process, he says, by the renewing of your mind through the word of God. So if you're not reading your Bible, how are you ever going to find what's right and what's true and what's good? How will you ever find what the values are if all you're watching is television and listening to corrupt, bought out media? You, you, you just, you're never going to find the truth that way. Right. You have to search the word of God and get God's perspectives. If you don't understand and you search, someone will help you grow in the word of God. The word of God in these hours needs to be our foundation for making decisions and running our life. It says in the book of Thessalonians, you're talking about the last days, and it said, God said, because they receive no love for the truth, I will send a great delusion upon them, and they believe lies. So, so we need to have a hunger for the truth. When you get up, read, start to read your Bible. Start to get a Bible plan. Make your way through the Bible. Get to know the stories of the Bible, the principle of the Bible. Get to love the Word of God. Wow. Oh, we've got so many things we could share on. Let me just, let me just give you another one. I've got, I'll, I'll shorten it. Hey, what about this? Did you know that the kingdom of heaven has an economic system, a financial system? You can't run a, you can't run a country without wealth. Here's the thing about wealth. Some of the wealthiest countries in the world are also the poorest. So some countries in the world that have the greatest natural resources are the poorest. So why is it if there's so much wealth in the land that they're so poor? The answer, the government. It's simply that. It's, it's the government. The government's corrupt. And they're being exploited. And people don't realize just what is happening in the world and the extent to which America is exploiting the nations for their resources. It's the cause of most of the wars is about economic resources and power. So heaven has its own economic system, how it runs, how it runs its money. And of course, in heaven, you don't need money because God's got everything there. The streets are paved with gold. The only place you need money is down here. And God doesn't need your money. But you see, people don't think that. They, they think God wants my money. Church wants my money. Everyone wants my money. They've got to get out of all other things. So basically, an economic system is a process or a method a government sets up that enables resources to be distributed. Right? That's what an economic system is. So if there's got good government policies, then it leads to prosperity and wealth and the creation of people or a nation that's very satisfied, very healthy. And so God has a kingdom financial system, a way of doing money. And God's system is unlimited. God is a God of abundance. Uh, he's a good father. Look at this. It says in Psalm 35, verse 27, Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say, The Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Now, what father wants his children to be poor? Struggle week to week, day to day. There's no dad or mum wants that. You want them to do well and do better than you if possible. God is a father. He delights in us prospering, doing well in life. However, I found for people to do well in life, they need to take initiatives. I was talking to one girl and, and uh, I was sharing with her and I said, well, are you thinking of getting married? She said, uh, yes, I'd like to get married. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm waiting for the right guy. I said, I just laughed. I just said this. Let me tell you this. Let me ask you this question. Can you point to me any arena in life where you succeed by waiting around? 
She was shocked. I said, waiting won't get it to happen. You'll, you'll just get old. <laughs> and she was shocked. But, but, but you understand, this is how a lot of Christians are, passive about everything. Amen. If you believe God, then you need to take the steps to be moving with God in the right direction so God's able to bring things to you. You know, it's only a moving car you can stare. If it's, it's, you can't stare it if it's sitting still. You've got to be on the move. And so I said, here's the first thing you do. I said, have you identified what you're looking for and are you praying for the man who's probably alive right now? No. I said, well, you're not even showing that you demonstrate God could bring him into your life. I said, you should be thinking of the qualities he has and you should be praying for that man, for God to bless him, keep him, prosper him, make him a passionate believer and open his eyes to see you. So when he sees you, he sees the one he's called to and you're not going around looking for everyone else. She said, I said, that, that, you could do that, but you're not doing it. You're just waiting, hoping something will turn up. Man, that's hopeless. And then I said, there's the other thing too. And I said, what have you got to bring in? So let's have a talk about your relationships with your father. I said, I noticed this, and I shared a few things. And before we know it, she's weeping and weeping. I said, you've got a life full of baggage, bitterness, you built walls, what man is going to come in? <laughs> Isn't going to happen. I said, you need to work firstly in faith for the right person to come that God has prepared for you and that you are the right helper for his assignment. Then you need to prepare yourself so when you enter the relationship, your heart is free from baggage and you've excluded automatically losers and broken people and you've now got good people in your heart that you're drawn to. And then just get on with serving God and be busy. Yeah. Now you're, it's gone real quiet. And I know when it goes quiet. You, no one ever told me to do that. <laughs> but God wants to prosper you. Bless you. We've got to do your part. You know, and so prosperity is always for a purpose. When God prospers you and he wants to, if you're a business, he, he doesn't want you to be struggling. He wants you to find a way to prosper in your business. He wants you to prosper in your finances, prosper in your resources. I talk to some people, they go, how are you doing? Well, they can barely get in by. And let me help you. The reason I can help you is that God's given me more than I need. I want to have more than I need so that I can help others. Yeah. Do you understand? So in Genesis 12 verse 2, he says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. So the reason God blesses, the purpose for blessing you in every arena of your life is so it will overflow and bless others. So you can help others, be kind to others. In terms of finances, be able to support other people. Help other people, give to other people. I have money set aside just to give to people when I feel God speak to me to do it. I don't want to be, I, I can't stand the thought of living and never being able to give. It just, I couldn't, just not how I'm called to live. We're not going to live that way. And, and so we want to be like that, see? So God wants you to, to overflow from his extravagance to others. Poverty, Jesus came to break the hold of poverty. Poverty is a curse. Some people think poverty, that, that, that poverty is something spiritual. No, it isn't. If you haven't got enough to survive, you've got nothing to bless anyone else. You're probably trying to get something from them. You understand? You, the, the purpose of being blessed is whatever you have, you can always share it and give it to someone. There's always someone who is worse off, someone who is needing help that you could give. Now, I'm not saying that you're stupid with your finances. In fact, quite the opposite. But one of the purposes of God's blessing is that we, be, that we bless others. So you need to understand a few things about the kingdom and, and why, and I can't develop it in depth now. But firstly is there's a spiritual conflict around money. There is a God of this world called the spirit of mammon that controls money and wealth and where it goes. Yeah. So, so many people, the reason they're wealthy is because they're in total agreement with that spirit. They're agents of that spirit and their money is for evil. You understand that, that, that there's a spiritual power. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is a spirit. God is a spirit. These are opposed to one another. God says all the silver and all the gold are mine. In other words, because he's the king, everything belongs to him, so he can make it come to you. Satan came to him and said, here's all the glory of these kingdoms. I'll give it to you if you worship me. Can you see there's a conflict here of who will be in charge of our life, who we're going to worship? 
So we've got to actually understand there's a warfare over wealth. We need to be in a place where we've got money under our control and not it controlling us. One of the ways is if you've got, you can check whether it's got control over you, whether you can release it when God wants it released. Mm, I know it gets quite tight about this time. <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, because it's a conflict. So it's a demonic spirit, spirit of Baal. And so several things that are a part of our, e e God's economic system. Number one is honoring the source. Honor the source. So is the money mine or, and I work, I work for it, it's all mine. No. God has provided for you, now honor him. So one of the first keys with whatever you have, you honor God with, with, with the first of it. And so the principle, uh, one of the key principles in the financial system of the kingdom is we always honor God in our giving. We, that means we place him first, acknowledge he's the source, and we seek him first in our finances and the way we do business. So many people, I, I watch them, and they, they, they want God to bless them, but they won't run their life and their finances God's way. They actually cheat people. And if you cheat people, you, it, 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 you can't get the blessing of God. I mean, God's not going to bless a cheater. He, he's listening to the other guy hurting. And so now I'm not going to flow on you that way. And so we honor God. So to honor God means that we, we give to God and we're generous to others. You can see scriptures like that. It talks about when we give to the poor, we lend it to the Lord, he will return it. Whoever despises the poor dishonors his maker. So in other words, honoring the Lord includes giving him the first portion of what we have. Now, I'm not saying how much. That's your honor. It comes out of your generosity and gratitude. But it's your honor to him. And then secondly, that you honor the Lord when you, when you actually care for people who are poor. When you despise people who are poor, don't help them, you're dishonoring God who created them. So honoring the Lord with our money is not just giving a tithe or something like that. Honoring the Lord with money is just, like, Lord, it came from you. I'm going to make sure you get the first portion, and I'll also look for opportunities to be generous to others and help them. Okay, second thing you've got to do with it is you've got to steward it properly. You've got to steward it properly. And uh, if God's given you resources, he requires that you learn how to manage it. So that means you budget, you get a plan, how the money's going to go and where it's going to go. Uh, you learn to manage it, so you keep a hold on what's going on. You save, you put some aside for saving, and you develop a faithfulness and integrity in the management of your money. Now you say, well, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You can do that, and that's how you get successful. It's because you're always honoring the source, you're always saving and putting money aside, and you're always living carefully on what you have and not just buying the biggest, latest, and whatever. And Pastor Dave ran a great seminar. It's helped a lot of people on that, and I encourage you if they run something financial later on in the year, get into it. Don't come for counsel because your finance is a problem if you won't go to a seminar to learn how to manage them. Because probably the first thing I'd ask you is, did you go to the seminar? Well, why are you coming for me to fix you up? You won't even go and educate yourself how to get right. We're responsible to do these things. Get help. Just get help. And uh, so we learn how to steward and manage and resource. And then the last thing about financial um, success is to create a generational legacy. The Bible tells us a good man leaves a legacy for his children's and, and generation to come. So that means investing and trading and innovation, adding value, starting a business. Uh, all of these things, God can give you ideas. And it's quite surprising the ideas God can give can get you into a zone that you were never in before. If you don't know how to invest money, get someone to advise you how to invest it. You say, I haven't got much money to invest. Well, look at where your coffees are going and cut down your coffees and then save up the coffee money. Just, you've got to start somewhere. For some people, if they counted up all the coffee monies and all the meals out through the year and all the fast food, man, I went down to make Maccas. I don't like going to Maccas. I went there once, took grandchildren there because they like it. So it was great. I went around and looked. I thought, yeah, there are all these people spending a fortune on this junk. Why don't you just buy some food down the shop and go cook it yourself? You know, you'd save a lot of money. It'd be a healthier meal. I'm not judging people. It's just if you want to get ahead, people who get ahead don't do that kind of thing. They don't buy stuff and charge up things that they're going to pay a lot of interest on. They don't do all of that kind of thing. 
They learn discipline, restraint, save, invest, grow, give. So these are things of the kingdom. And if you don't know how to do it because no one ever showed you, then you find someone who can. Pray for someone to help you. Don't be ashamed. I don't know what to do. And they will help you. I've seen, we've got Janice in the church. Janice, I love. When Janice came into the church, she was, uh, uh, she was, um, had been abandoned by her husband, been abandoned when she was a young girl, went from pillar to post, went to every kind of home, was abused, suffered many, many, many things. Married this man, had two daughters, beautiful daughters, and then he abandoned her too and left her with thousands of dollars of debt. She paid it off, he came back, then she left, he left her again, left her with more debt, and she, she committed to pay it all off. Amazing. So we've loved her and helped her on her journey, and now she gives to people, constantly gives to people. You think, how can she do that? She's just, how can she do it? Well, she does it because it's in her heart to do it. And she's ordered her life around God being the first priority and always making sure she had something to give. And so she's helped young people into camps. She's blessed our pastors. She's blessed this one and that one at different times, blessed us at different times. I think, you know, it feels almost hard to take the money, but actually realize this is part of a life she's developed. But there's people who have much more than her and have never developed that life. It'd be a good time to just make changes. We're part of a kingdom. It operates differently. Okay. Well, I'll probably need, no, I think I'll just need to finish and draw it in there. I had lots of things on the kingdom, and I'd love to share just on the authority and power of the kingdom at some time and help you understand the importance in coming into a kingdom of understanding that there's a whole system of authority and chain of command and learning how to relate to God through that. People we see, people that are above us, people that are beside us, people that are us, recognizing layers of authority and learning to understand God has given you authority. God has given you authority. As you come under his kingship and kingdom, he gives you authority to pray for the sick. He gives you authority to cast out demons. He gives you authority to declare the word of God over people. He gives you authority to invite and open a door for the Holy Spirit to come. He authorizes us everywhere we go to speak on His behalf and represent Him. But that just requires we understand our call. We are kingdom citizens here to make a difference. Amen. Let's just lift our hands right now. I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit. Just welcome him to come. We talked about culture and, and some cultures are so abusive, people are deeply wounded. Some cultures, including our own culture now, if you look at the child statistics, you'll see the culture has broken away from the ways of God. Here's an interesting thing. That when the gospel went right through the world, everywhere the gospel went and people abandoned worship of idols and demons, the culture changed and prospered. So the advancement of the gospel has brought a great prosperity and growth through the world. As our Western world has turned away from the gospel and its foundations and back to old ways, the old gods have started to reappear. Now we have the destruction of the infants we have sexual perversion, prostitution, slavery, wicked evil things emerging on a scale we couldn't even imagine. We see broken homes, violence and addiction. All of this tells us our culture is breaking down. It's abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another kingdom is asserting its dominion. You're a citizen of God's kingdom Pray, pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for souls to be saved. Pray for the brokenhearted to be healed. Pray for people to hunger for God. Pray for our city. Pray for the community. Pray for our families. Stand in the gap. Pray for our schools. Gather and pray for a spirit of revival to come into the schools. Pray for evil to be uncovered. Pray for poverty to be broken. Pray for marriages to be healed. Pray for people with addictions to be set free. 
pray for the power of God to come. Begin to pray over your finances. Put them in the hands of the Lord. Submit them into His hands. Pray for prosperity. Pray blessing on what you have. Relook at what you're doing. Start to intentionally give. Invite people in. Give them a meal. Make them welcome. Show kindness. Start to put your finances so you're able to give. Invest in learning how to manage finances. Invest learning how to create wealth. Don't just be passive. Break out of that today and say, God, I want to be a powerful vessel, a worker of miracles, ability to give in Jesus' name. Come on, let's in all our hearts. That's what God has put this church here for. Heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, proclaim liberty, set people into a place of prosperity, advance the kingdom of God. Why don't we stand right now? Let's begin to clap and shout to the Lord. Let's worship Him right now. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Here am I, Lord. Show me the parts of my family culture that I need to repent of. Restore and rebuild. Show me the parts of culture I'm in compromise with and need to resist. Show me, Lord. Show me the kingdom of heaven. Show me the culture of heaven. Father, I pray your kingdom to come. Father, I pray prosperity, promotions, divine opportunities, business ideas, creativity. God, open the windows of heaven. Open the windows of heaven. Let your kingdom come. Healing miracles, creative miracles, Deliverances, salvations. Oh God, we cry for our city. Hastings, Blacksmith, Havelock, Napier. We call upon them to come. Let the spirit of evangelism flow out of the house. Lord, let this place be full of your glory. Come on, let's worship him. Worship Him. Worship our King. What an honor to be in the kingdom of God. To serve our King. Come on, let's worship Him. Let the joy arise in you. The kingdom of heaven. any person here and you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ never made a decision to open your life to the God who loves you gave himself for you this is your day this is your moment Jesus invited every person to come to him if you're burdened heavy laden come come to me not come to a method Come to a person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross for your sins. It's your sins keep you separated. It's your sins bring the bondage. It's living in a destructive kingdom causes so much damage and pain. Jesus said, come. Come into my kingdom. Repent. Turn away from that old way of living, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you're here today and you want to receive Jesus Christ, 
We're going to go back and sing. I encourage you to make your way to the front. I will lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. We won't embarrass you. We will lead you to the one who loves you, to encounter him. Make your way to the front if that's you. And if you're here today and there's a sickness in your body, you're tormented by some spirit, make your way to the front as well. Say, God, God, today I need to encounter you. Is there anyone else wanting to give their life to Jesus? Come on, anyone else? Make your way to the front right now. Anyone else? Make your way to the front. Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. If you want to return to Jesus, you've fallen away. You say, I want to come back to Him. Make your way to the front. If you've got a sickness, the doctor said we can't do anything about it. Dare to believe Jesus could heal it. Dare to believe. Is there anyone else? Come, come. If you're troubled and tormented, the bricks. Make your way. a lot of courage to do something like this, to step out of a crowd of people. And sometimes we don't even know why we did it. Well, I'm up the front. How do I get up here? <laughs> I remember for me, I was hanging on, trying not to come. And then later I thought, why, why did I wait so long? God loves you. He understands your life. He understands what you've been through and how you've tried to find recognition and purpose because it was never there in your background God understands the pain He understands your brokenness all you wanted was to be loved and people have done so many things that brought such shame but God loves you He receives you as you are all He wants is you just to believe that He died for you and if you'll receive Him just turn away from sin and turn to him and say, Jesus, I want you to become the center in my life. I want to follow you. What I mean following has really hurt me. I want to follow you. I want to become the man, the woman you call me to be. I was born for more than this. I, I'm not going to live in this state anymore. Jesus, I turn to you. Okay, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. We're going to get the whole church to pray the prayer. It's a very simple prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. So just close your eyes, everyone in the room. Just follow me in the simple prayer. We've all prayed the prayer at one point, but join with those at the front who are praying it for the first time. When we pray, God will hear us and respond. Just follow me now. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I ask you to forgive me all of my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your spirit and presence into my life. And I give you my life today. I belong to you. You will never leave me. You'll never abandon me. I belong to you. Today I've become a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. Amen.